us, Fortune clearly said, um, the, the migrants media network was was aimed at engaging the diaspora on constructive social media truth. The social media truth, as we know, truth can be relative. So the social media truth is about how do you interpret what you read and the messages that are online. How do you how do you understand that message? What is if some if I post myself standing in front of a portion? Yeah, I just arrived yesterday from Ghana, for instance, and I'm pushing in front of a portion, and I'm saying, that's my life. Mm. You know, so how do you tell people that this guy is still looking for a study, actually he doesn't have a portion, you know? So it is about engaging people to ethically consume the information they get on social media, and that is the other main fact. And so on that we deal with understanding how migrants and potential migrants interact with social media channels. And in this extent, uh, towards how does this impact their decisions to migrate or not to migrate? In general, how does the interaction with social media enable migration as an opportunity as well? Because if, as you said before, if there's this lady who wants to migrate back at home but is questioning herself, do I really go back or do I, we call it here, do I go underground? So that means you throw away your documents and go underground. But these people have to be informed about the opportunities that are coming up in, in Ghana. I was in Kenya recently and met um, a former friend of mine who was starting a logistics company. The guy is living, I always repeat, a better life than I'm living in Germany. There are big and good opportunities. But because we have this mind that you talked about, I can only make it when I stay here, we live in this consumption. So return entrepreneurship and also transnational entrepreneurship. Transnational entrepreneurship meaning if Bismarck here stays here and thinks, ah, oh, there's a business opportunity that I can connect with Ghana and trying to explore those opportunities. How can social media contribute to that? How does social media activate and, con and, and contribute to return migrant stigmatization? That those people who, unfortunately, have been deported. It's not my, it's not my work to start questioning those policies because I cannot change. But then when these people arrive at home, they are in a situation where they're sometimes not even welcome at home. And how does social media contribute to that? As we heard before, the stories of why did you come here, come here without making it big? And this is very much communicated on social media. And so we have had cases of people committing suicide just because of that. And what role does social media play? And how can we intervene? How do the, um, the human smugglers use social media as a marketing tool? They do use it as a marketing tool. And then how, do we, how can we inform them the potential migrants, the residents, that social media and every message they see there does not necessarily have to be true, and it is not true that it may be coming from whatever individuals. It, be, it can be coming from human smugglers. So that is the information we try to give with that. And why without social media, is, as, as we understand, is that social media, and this is something that I got from the co-creation with the participant, is that social media has become, even for us here in Germany, has become a primary source of information for many people. And it is very much true from the sub-Saharan Africa. If they take this information that is there as a fact, and there is much of misleading information, and make their decision to travel based on those messages and posts, that is something that we now have to, to deal with, and that's what we are trying to do at that process. So to do that, to do that, that's what the, the project, using the various, the various um, understandings of this particular topic, we invited some, uh, we invited some young the aspirants living here to be able to make sure that we don't tell our own stories, but actually get the stories from the diaspora, get the stories from the Ghanaian diaspora, so that in that case, we don't create something for ourselves, but create something that is co-created with, with the diaspora, and that is much more aimed to those stories that they have gone through and they understand in their countries of origin. And so, the aim of that, the aims of the Ghana project, the aim of the um, Ghana project project, is engaging the members of the Ghanaian diaspora on social media sensitization, and at the same time, we're trying to provide offline tools like what Jody is going to be talking about later the field guide in order to make sure we, 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 we spread out information on remote regions of Ghana. So we created, at the same time, we were able to create a network of particular uh, pickup points or stations where people can go and be able to learn about migration, opportunities back at home, human smuggling, and all those topics that we were covering. Um, 
And it's very important that because we have been dealing with DeFi it now as a, uh, as a as a project to be able to 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 mitigate propaganda, hate speech, and all this kind of misinformation that happens on social media. So we bring all our experiences from um, DeFi it now. We brought them also to this project to make sure there is a, a mature consumption of information on social media. And as important is to make. Uh, informed decision making process or to enable informed decision making process in regards to migration. Inform also, at the same time, instead of telling people please don't migrate irregularly, then we tell them what opportunities will exist at home and how can you explore these opportunities. So we don't stop at do not migrate irregularly, but rather go a step further and try to show people what opportunities will exist at home. And a wonderful group of people here, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have, and because I want to mention this. We believe on a south-to-south -south solutions, and so when it came to training about social media and the use of social media, we did not just get someone from Germany, but really ask someone from the south, in global south, Jetsana here, to come and train us and the others about the social media sensitization. So really, from the south to the south as a concept. And I think that is a nice way to be able to tell people and to communicate people at an high level and also in, in, in covers a little bit of some cultural aspect that may come. To solve all that, uh, I'm a design thinking trainer, so I always try to put design thinking wherever possible. And so we created, we used a design thinking process of co-creation not only to explore um, messages on social media, but also to co-create and work on the materials and data and documentation for creating the field guide and all other materials. Yes. During that process of design thinking and co-creation, we identified four individuals. So these four individuals, we are calling them the personas. So we have the travel agent. This is a picture from the foreign affairs. And we like that because it talks about the, the un, uh, uncovering or undressing the travel agent. So he has a nice office, looks like an official guy, but in real sense, in many concepts, he's a human smuggler. We have to undress him, to uncover him, to show him who he really is. And that's one person we, we identify. Then we identify him, I don't know if that name is written well. The Boga. The Boga? Is it written well? No, yeah? No. No. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not a, an English it's word. It's not an English word. It's a PG word, I think. It's so I can, I've been planning how to pronounce that one for the last five months. Boga. <laughs> so, so the Boga is that the Aspra guy. They, I always put myself. Um, so he comes with bling, 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 coming down up to here. The trouser is up to here, and he walks in a different style. And when he comes home, he has made life. As we had before, that is not necessarily true, right? But when he comes, it also going to Europe is very easy. It's like A and B, you are there which is not necessarily not true. And the next, um, that one's, whoops, sorry. And the next individual we realized is at the potential, at uh, the potential migrant, who doesn't really know where do I get the right information? How do I get informed? And so this person now is looking for information wherever, wherever place possible. And he's ready to believe anything as long as it is on social media and he doesn't know how to consume, how to evaluate this information. And then we have the other persona is the, the migration administrator. Who he, he has to adhere to a particular policy that has been set for him. And he doesn't know now how do I give this information to this particular individual, to the potential migrant, that it's not automatic just because uh, it's not automatic that you, there is a big ship waiting for you in Libya with cinema and a pool, and you can directly walk in and you travel to Europe. So he has this information, but he does not know how to pass that information. And so, identifying these personas, we're trying to develop materials around that. And one of the materials we developed, and which I would like my colleague Jody Rose to come and introduce, is the field guide. Mm -hmm. Jody, I've had the great honour of working with the Rogue Agency um, on, first of all, the Defy Hate Now, Social Media Hate Speech Mitigation Field Guide. Um, which we then developed the specific parts about verifying um, misinformation rumours um, using social media ethically and responsibly developed into this project with Thomas. And it's been amazing. Like, I'm actually from a migration background myself. All, all of my forebears migrated to New Zealand or Australia. 
is that between 1855 and 19-something, from Germany, uh, Scotland, England, and Ireland. And I'm the only one who's come back. Um, and I, so I actually do understand also the, the issues about migrating to Germany. And I've had the luxury of being able to do that as a freelance writer and artist, um, which is something that wasn't sort of known that much. I think it's, it's like I discovered it because people I knew here were able to do that. And um, I'm also very grateful to be able to live in Germany and do this work. And so I, was, I sort of have a personal connection as well to this, this you know, the, the, the possibilities of migration. And I came here to live as an artist full-time, um, and I kind of, as a personal thing, not representing the, the, the project or the agency, I, I believe that we need to live in a world without borders and without nation-states, and that everyone should be free to make the life they want for themselves. I think a lot of people want to stay in their home countries where their families are, where they're connected. Um, and so putting together this material was really amazing. Um, and so we had the input from all of the participants in the first workshop, so thank you so much for your perspectives and your knowledge, because it really gave so much fine-grained detail to what we could put together. And then Sarah did some amazing research, Glenn also compiled stories, um, and Cara did a fantastic job of laying it out. And so, um, for me it was also really, really important that we focus on what are the informed informed choices and what are the other possibilities if you've got like five thousand dollars you're paying to a people smuggler how could you possibly use that to, to build a life for yourself in a different way and so basically we kind of go through looking at migration contexts um, the dangers of irregular migration um, we have sort of discussion questions and and having the publication as a sort of physical object is really important because there's not always internet access um, and people are not always necessarily looking at the official channels of information was something that I understood from the participants that, okay, you're not, you maybe won't look at the government website, but also trying to highlight, like, these are sort of the, the researched official places to get information to then make a decision about how you want to undertake that migration journey or not. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I think that's probably all I have to say, if anyone has any small questions. Also, I mean, learning about how the kind of, the people smugglers and traffickers use social media to um, engage people and the kind of misinformation they give and trying to help build up that kind of media literacy about how to find correct information and um, how to share it. And I think I'm really interested to hear back more from the group about the training that they've done um, since we put this together. So it was a pilot project and we're developing it more mm -hmm. for the next next year, hopefully, um, and there are a couple of things that we kind of missed, like what are the next steps? So how can you then connect with um, the you know, community innovators, entrepreneurs, learn skills, um, or what are the, you know, there's some specific information about the steps coming to Germany as a, to work or study, um, and so we'll keep, we'll keep developing it, and so this is a really important forum as well to kind of understand better that sort of fine detail. Thank you all. Oh, and it also comes, so it also comes with a USB key with additional material and a facilitation guide and a game and um, quite a lot of, um, yeah, quite a lot of detail that we've tried to make as relevant and useful as possible. So that's always my aim is that I'm not making this for someone in an office in Germany to look at. I'm making it for people who are really giving training person to person to use. And so I'm very open to your criticism, feedback, input for things that you think could be better. Yes. Thank you. I think one of, the, one of the challenges, one of the hesitations I had about the project was being very careful that it wasn't playing into an anti-migration narrative. And so I really, really, really worked to make sure that we were giving um, information and, and choices from a very neutral kind of place. Um, and for me, it was probably the challenge was synthesizing the different kinds of input and information from very different voices and trying to make it something coherent that could be then well used and that was clear and you know like you know possible to navigate also it was a bit challenging because I was back in Australia at the time so <laughs> I then migrated back to Germany um, partly for this project because I so I, I feel really passionate about it and it was really um, it was really exciting to see it take shape and then to see it being used and to hope that it can play a kind of a, a, a useful role in, um, you know, helping people make life choices in a way that will bring them to a, a good place, wherever that is. Yeah. The starting point was, of course, the four years of research that we had in terms of how social media and conflict 
in itself work. Um, and uh, I thought it was really interesting to see like how much of that material was actually relevant to migration issues already. Like the, the, the means of getting information is always the most difficult element in a lot of this kind of stuff. So you know, a large part of our work is then to, you know, to channel the right type of information and to be able to give it in a way that people don't have difficulties in getting. So enabling the access to the information um, is, is that element that we're trying to build into these, uh, these resources. And that's why it takes place also in different forms and formats. Like they each have a very specific uh, sense of direction, let's say. As I mentioned before, I mean, one of the main things that we do with the Find Eight Now and also with the Migrant Media Network is look at what are the quickest, easiest, most direct ways for people to access information. Um, and in, in South Sudan, um, we started to look at um, USSD delivery of, of information. Um, just for those of you who do not know what specifically USSD stands for, it is Unstructured Supplementary Service Data. Okay? Um, and as that name um, implies, it is service data. Um, and we don't use USSD so much in Germany, but um, in, in many countries where, um, let's say, um, being online or you know, having to pay uh, for bundles and stuff to be online is, is an issue, um, we rely on the structures that the telecommunications companies themselves have. So if we buy a bundle from provider A or provider B or whatever, um, we can generally use their services without extra charges. And all those companies, they have uh, these little codes in them like um, star, well, like hit this one here, star 711, star 107 hash. Yeah, typical, this is a typical USSD code which can get you into your account, for example. So you get a, you get a menu um, that says, you know, I want to top up my bundle, um, I want to buy, I don't know, Christmas present for my kids, blah, 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 and that brings you then to another menu and you can do those actions. Um, the point is, why don't we use this kind of system uh, for delivering information, for example, about migration or other, other means of you know, using social media, etc. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a vastly untapped um, information uh, resource. It's extremely easy to use, um, and you can, you can design any kind of information structure and system for it. You can also connect it um, to incentives. Like if you, um, you can get a credit um, if you use a certain kind of information or pass it on to somebody. Um, and um, so we, we decided to um, look at a way to use this uh, in Ghana. Uh, we're working together with an organization called Kumasi Hive, uh, which is a media uh, and technology lab in the town of Kumasi. And it's great to have Gameli here, who is part of that organization. Um, uh, we're partners with uh, Kumasi had for, for some years in a number of uh, open science and open hardware and global innovation gathering uh, scenarios. And um, they've taken on the task of, of piloting um, what is now being coined like Migrate Safely um, as, as a USSD application. Can you just run through the other slides? I mean, it's, it's always a little clunky of how to, you know, talk about or something, show something like that without actually doing it. Um, the, the, first, the first prototype for testing um, is, is, is out there. And what's most important right at this point is to see whether or not this, this information that, that is being built into the system <coughs> makes, makes any sense or not. Uh, so there's user testing going on. I mean, even these, um, you know, these terms themselves might be a little too clunky. Like, okay, do I want regular migration, irregular migration, or alternatives to regular migration? Um, the, the next step is to sort of go from this sort of like wonky policy talk to kind of like street speak. Yeah. Um, and this this is a process of, of iteration. Uh, you know, first 
who are trying to get in the actual chunks of information that you know we want to work with. The next step will be, can you just, there's a whole pile of slides, so just slowly run through, because we're not gonna be able to get through all this, this kind of stuff. Like, there's many, many, many layers of types of information. So, as I said, the, the current uh, phase, or what's just kind of ending, is, is really to get the, the basic material in there. Um, and the feedback, uh, the feedback loop that we're working with right now, where friends from Kazi Hive are doing on the ground, is, is how to make this then um, in this more user-friendly um, speed. Um, and we'd love to get also like feedback from, from you guys who are in, in Ghana on you know how this can work uh, better. Um, the, the programming of USSD is fairly straightforward. It's, a, it's an old school technology um, which is used by just about every single person um, in many of the countries that were working as long as they have a mobile phone. Um, and we have um, from uh, Mr. Stefan Othia, a team comes from Ghana. If you could like just later to test it. Ah, okay, we could maybe do that when we yeah. network around. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's got more of an advantage to us because he was actually there. Yeah. Um, but um, the the only the only the only hindrance to more of these kinds of systems being used for different types of information um, uh, distribution and so on is you have to negotiate with the cell phone uh, because they own the codes. Um, and this was a little bit of our problem in in South Sudan uh, because. It, it, it costs them very little to actually provide this, this information in their system, but they see it as a big money-making thing um, you know, for themselves. And we somehow think that they should have some corporate social responsibility to provide these kinds of informations for the people using their systems. Um, and um, so the better the relationship can be with the telco, uh, the easier it is to get access to the codes. And um, the other the other hindrance is that of course if you um, if you're on the Vodafone network the codes are different than if you're on uh, MTN network for example. So we want to um, in the in the Gata pilot um, we're trying to see like how what the, what deals can we get with the telcos and get access to codes for all of them. So ultimately it doesn't really matter uh, you know what the code is. Um, because you, you get provided with um, with the codes depending on what which which telco you happen to uh, uh, to be with. Um, but um, as far as we're concerned, um, this is probably the quickest and easiest way to get direct information to people. No apps to download. No other kind of you know tricky things going on online. I can't get this. Blah blah blah. Don't have the right browser, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is really really simple, straightforward information, and it's much much more interactive, for example, than, than SMS, where you kind of have to know who you're specifically sending something to. It's one of the systems that helps bring together all the various um, information systems that we've already been uh, developing, and um, so and, and part of that package is sort of the I mean, for me, this is all kind of part of the, the field guide as well as, as, a, as a resource. Um, we started also working uh, with this um, small company that's uh, based actually in Nakuru in Kenya called Hyrak Tech. Um, they, uh, they make a very simple Raspberry Pi based um, offline server. Um, there's one sitting right over there. Um, there's uh, there's two versions actually of it. There's this. This is this is what I call the big the big box. Um, there's a Raspberry Pi Zero version, which is about half that size. Fits very easily in your pocket, and you can emulate um, basically whatever kind of curated web content uh, you want with it. So it's a very powerful tool to use in offline and mobile uh, uh, scenarios. We um, we put on the major, um, uh, let's say, free access uh, information packages onto these um, offline servers um, so that, that they can be then used um, in training sessions or at these access points, information centers, 
wherever. You can connect to the Hi-Rack box um, just any way you connect any other router or server with the Wi-Fi connection, um, and then you can immediately access that material. The other thing that we use the Hi-Rack box for um, already in, in other projects is actually just very basic um, internet literacy. So you can learn how does this internet thing work, how do browser structures work, query structure, all that kind of stuff. So you can use it for all kinds of media literacy uh, training, not just for you know serving up certain kinds of, uh, of information. Yeah, so this is just a little bit of how to, uh, how you do it. Basically, you look for it in the network. Um, and that, is that one on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. So, I mean, if anybody wants to just kind of, you know, try it out, uh, we'll, we'll put this slide back on later, later on, but, um, yeah, you basically have to, you know, disconnect yourself from other networks. Um, you pick, I guess it's High Rack Box, it's not the mini. Yeah, yeah, so you'll see that on your list of... MMN, MMN High Rack Box. Yeah, MMN High Rack Box. You'll see that on your list of, of, of networks. Um, and then when you've connected to it, you have to open up a browser anything, any browser on your device, and, and put in this IP address. And that IP address will give you uh, the direct um, uh, link to the material on the IRAC box. It doesn't necessarily work just automatically on its own. So it's very important that we, you know, that we do training. That's one of the reasons we do training of trainers. And we very specifically look for, um, yeah, community multipliers, for example. Either they're teachers already, people who are already in a kind of a, a media center type thing, or youth leaders, people who also feel that, you know, they they have ownership, you know, of this type of material, want to be able to, uh, you know, interact, you know, with, with their communities. You know, you just, just stick it on a desk somewhere, it'll be gone. Um, and um, that is, you know, that is, that is difficult, but that, that's part of our work, you know, to establish that kind of network. 